Father, we're thankful, we're grateful. We don't have to think of anything in particular. Just thank you. Be glorified in these few minutes. Thank you for your servants here at Shiloh. Pray that your hand will be here. You'll manifest yourself one more time before this day shall have ended. We'll give you praise. Through Jesus Christ we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. Now reach over and shake hands with somebody nearby and just simply say to them, please celebrate with me because every day something has tried to kill me but has failed. And that's the truth. That's the truth. And that's the truth. <laughs> half, half of y'all, half of y'all didn't open your mouth. That's why you can't get your deliverance. You don't obey. Shake hand with somebody and tell them celebrate with me. Because every day, something has tried to kill me, but has failed. If you don't have anything to be grateful for, you don't have anything to celebrate, just celebrate for me. If you didn't have disease to try to kill you, if it wasn't blood pressure, if it wasn't a bathtub, <laughs> Where's the little fella? He said, it's the bathtub. If it wasn't a bathtub, it was your crazy kin people. They tried to worry you to death. I ain't trying to play the dozens. I ain't trying to play the dozens. Hallelujah. But you know most of your kin folks is crazy. I know mine are. Hallelujah. If it wasn't that, it was something trying to scare you to death. Trying to aggravate you on your job. But every day, something has tried to kill you. But it failed. Let me... Let me sit down, y'all. Let me honor Bishop uh, Elder Allen, Dr. Allen, and his wife on this 23rd pastoral anniversary celebration for him. And I think this is Sister Utanya's first year. Uh, in the anniversary celebration and in the 40 years of his ministry. I'm with the uh, alderman or councilman, I forgot what it is. Huh? Commissioner, county commissioner. Uh, I'm with him, 23 years, a long time to do anything. Hallelujah. But I honor you, Dr. Allen, and I appreciate 
the fact that you've always been the same in the years that I've known you and seen you. I didn't know you close up. I didn't know you real close up. I don't have very many friends. I don't want many new ones. It's too much maintenance. I don't want to be bothered. Too much, too much maintenance. Yeah, it's too, too much to try to keep up. Got to call them and send cards. I got to remember, to remember birthdays. Please, Jesus, just worry me. Just, just worry me. Too much. Look at somebody and say, it just gets on my nerves. And tell the truth. Not true. You, uh, you, um, you fool around and forget one birthday, you got an enemy. But I've observed you over the years and I appreciate your constancy, your consistency in holiness. The Pentecostal Churches of Christ presents you this apostolic tribute unto all to whom these presents shall come greetings in Jesus name by the grace of God and with an eye single to his glory I Jesse Delano not Delano I don't look Italian to you it's Delano <laughs> Delano Ellis presiding prelate of the Pentecostal churches of Christ along with overseer Sabrina J Ellis by this testimonial, celebrate with Dr. Sherman C.G. Allen, Senior Pastor of Shiloh. During your 23rd pastoral anniversary celebration and 40 years of ministry to the body of Christ. This certificate is granted as testimonial of our personal regard for Dr. Allen's dedication and faithfulness to the ministry in the Fort Worth Metroplex Texas, given on this 27th day of August in this 2006 year of our Lord. David, would you hand that to Dr. Allen for me? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ain't much, it's just, uh, but it's another piece of paper for you to hang around somewhere, you know. Men hang everything on the wall. Women put everything in a drawer. <laughs> uh, my wife, she won't hang stuff up. I put stuff up, just put a nail in a hole in the wall and she come along fussing about her wall like I didn't contribute to the wall. <laughs> Don't miss my wall too. I paid for the wall. Hang what I want to on the wall. I just keep right on going with this story, you know. But I appreciate you. I appreciate. I appreciate Sister Otanya. I have known her. We came along in the same church. And I've known her since she was a child. And I can't even remember what age I would have met her and her dear mother. I don't even remember how old you might have been. I know you were you're eight years of age, about, about eight. That's a long time. You did have to hold up that many fingers to, to remind me of how old I am. But I appreciate you, and when I heard that the two of you were going to marry, I, uh, I gloried in the spunk of Sherman C.G. Allen. He went to headquarters and took the chief apostle secretary. Uh, so I, I said, that's a nervy little fella there. Uh, nervy, nervy. Nervy. I tell you what, I used to kind of call you behind your back. We used to call you the high chair bishop. <laughs> Somebody said they was going to lunch with you. I said, get a high chair. <laughs> the shortest man in Pentecost. Isn't that low down? 
Well, I've confessed it now. Thank the Lord. I can be delivered. I mean, he walked right up to the general bishop's office and got the woman off the computer. <laughs> Dragged her back down into hell. It's hot as hell out there. It's hot, hot. I got off the plane, came out the terminal, and I said to the man, the brother that came and picked me up, I thought I saw him a minute ago. He moved around. I came out, I said, oh, it's rehearsal for hell down here. <laughs> Soaking wet before we got to the car. Jesus. Jesus. I might be that as it may. I appreciate the invitation to come here to Fort Worth. It's been a lot of years since I came to Fort Worth. The last time I came here was Love Sanctuary. The late elder battles was the pastor. I preached there years ago. And Elder Battle's widow is sitting here. She's my mother-in-law. Uh, Mother Almira Battles, Henderson Battles. Sitting right here. She and her daughter and her son played hooky from their church to be, to be with her son-in-law. And I'm sure that their pastors don't mind and if they do, they will recover. We're a, we're a close-knit family. I'm married to her oldest daughter, her eldest daughter. She likes for me to say it that way. And she's at home preaching today. And she preached this morning at 8 o'clock. And she should be about finished now, the 11 o'clock service. And she preached, he is the God of the valleys. And, uh, and I'll give you my subject in a minute. Uh, my sister-in-law, Candy uh, Morton, and my brother-in-law, George Klinkscale, are here with my mother-in-law. I think I'm one of the most fortunate men in that most men uh, that I talk to groan and grumble about their mother-in-laws or mothers-in-law. I don't. I have a good one. I have what I classify as the best mother-in-law what makes her so good is not just that she is good by nature, she minds her own doggone business. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I don't have no trouble. I don't have no trouble. She don't have no remarks, no comments. She come to my house, she go to her room, come out whenever she feel like, and then go to her room whenever she feel like. And she don't create problems. She don't get with her daughter against me. Amen. Of course, I don't give her nothing to get with. I just, you know, I know how to stay out of all of them's way when they get together. And let them just talk and talk three or four conversations going on. I just stay out of it. I know that don't come before me. That's them women up in there in the kitchen talking. But I remember everything they say and talk about them like a dog when they leave. <laughs> and lastly, I have Deacon David Cottingham who's traveling with me from Cleveland. Uh, he is my traveling 
adjutant and my son in ministry. I, um, I'm not supposed to travel alone much anymore. When I say celebrate with me because every day something has tried to kill me, I've had cancer four times over the last eight years. Uh, started with prostate cancer. And I encourage you brothers, go get checked. Go bend over. Don't, don't just start. Oh, nobody. No, just shut up and bend over. Take your proctology. Let the doctor find if there's anything to find. Because that thing creep up on you. It's not painful. It doesn't hurt. So you don't know you have it. You don't know. Until one day you go to pass your water and you can't pass it as fast. You know you're full but you can't empty. Then you start feeling like something is wrong. The problem ain't in the front, it's in the back. Go get yourself checked. It is a generic thing. It is a genetic thing, rather. It's genetic. It's part of the black culture and black blood system. It's in our bone marrow. So go get checked. Sit there and look at me if you want to. Call your doctor. Make your appointment. And if it's just your prostate slightly enlarged, then give you stuff to kind of shrink it. It's a, it's a stop the problem. Stop the problem. Head it off. Every man in here, said, look at another man and holler, go head it off. Because it will kill you. It'll kill you before you know it. Y'all don't pay me no mind if you want to. And then you'll be trying to get Elder Allen to pray, pray you a smaller prostate. Hey, hey, your prostate big as an orange. Yeah. When it ain't supposed to be no bigger than, a, than, a, than a, a, a nut, you know, a walnut. Yeah, hey, you got an orange in the back of you. Get it checked. Y'all laughing at me. Some of y'all, some laughing, some trying to be all embarrassed. And y'all looking all down. Your wife wants you to get it checked. You ain't no service if you don't get it checked. Now, don't make me just go off. We got children in here. Oh, they should have warned you that I say whatever's on my mind. Whatever comes up. Did you all tell them that? Yeah, I usually say whatever I'm thinking about. So be careful. Don't go off and get all snooty. Because I'll tell you where it's at. Go and get checked. That's what I did. I went and got checked. But I went too late. Nobody told me. And so I had prostate cancer. And it's worst stages. And they took the prostate out. And I thought I was getting all right. You know, getting all right. After six months of radiation. They radiated me. They cooked me. Until from here. From here to here, I was as black as this suit. I'm normally brown, but I was black in an ashy, scaly. You know, ashy anyway because of my color, but scaly. You, you pull your, your, your drawers off and, and, and you still in your drawers. Your skin is all in there. They laughing. Now why y'all laughing? Say y'all low down. Y'all say that's what y'all y'all low down laughing. Well, but skin peeling daily. Got to shake my stuff out in the garage or outdoors. And just can't believe it. Couldn't believe it. Six months. But the PSA went down but not flat. It just went down and it was still readable. And they kept checking, kept checking, kept checking, kept checking. Finally, the PSA went down, but all of my energy went up. Walking from that chair to here, 
I'd get up to preach. I'd be so tired. I'd just lean over. I'd say, you know, I'm so tired. I don't know what to do. I'd just stand up and tell the folk, I'm tired. I'm going to start this message. And then I'd start a message. I said, I'm tired. And I'd start and go sit down. I'd just go sit down. Anybody feel like preaching? Just preach this. I said, that's a terrible feeling. You feel so inadequate. And all of a sudden, I start growing big lumps under my neck and under my armpits. At first, under my arms, I thought it was bad deodorant. I said, oh, well. I might have to change my deodorant. It wasn't deodorant. Mom went to the doctor and said, does it hurt? I said, no, nothing hurt. It's just all big. I had to get a bigger collar and stuff. He said, I hate to tell you, but you have CLL. I said, and who is that? Chronic lymphocytic leukemia. I said, what does that mean? He said, cancer everywhere. Now you get that, get ready to die. Pay up your insurance and get ready for death. Because normally, normally, there is no relief or cure. Normally. Unless you have bone marrow transplant, which it, for most people of color or people who just don't have means, you're going to die because you can't afford it. Bone marrow transplant, they don't give you with food stamps. It starts at a quarter of a million dollars. And who has a quarter of a million dollars laying around? I didn't. Now, while they are treating me for the CLL, with chemo now for a year every day except Saturday and Sunday. I'm laying in the hospital one hour or five hours on Monday and one hour and a half to one hour and 45 minutes every day. That means I didn't have a life. I'm laying there while they put that drip, 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 drip stuff in my veins. Sleep a while, talk a while. Crack jokes, keep everybody in that who was dying with me, keep them laughing. Tell me, if you're going to die, laugh. Don't lay up here and look like you in the mob. Don't do that. Y'all straighten out until the folk, it got so patience would ask to be in my room. Tell me, I don't want all these white women in the room with me. What's the trouble? You get me lynched. Don't do that. But the cancer cells kept showing up in the tests. They did bone marrow bi biopsy. When they drill into your hip, it is called the biopsy. They went into the hip. They put you to sleep as much as they can, and then they, they take a drill, and they drill down into your hip. And when they hit it right, you start kicking, you can't, it's like you're being electrocuted, but they tell you don't move. How do you not move? And then they pull it out and watch the blood come out and they catch it. And the first time it was like syrup. Sabrina, my wife, stood there and watched it. Now, usually she, she faints over a dead roach, but she stood there and watched it. She said, but the... Well, I'll tell you about the last time they did it. And, 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 and they did that, and they put me on the chemo, and they got me ready for bone marrow transplant, but they kept finding this cancer cell. And behind the back of this kidney on this side, there were two carcinomas the size of a hen egg attached to my kidney. They were cancerous. So they cut me open from here all the way back here, made a big smiley face on my side, raised the shades, reached in, turned my kidney around, cut the carcinomas off, put them in a dish, took them to pathology, 
turned my kidney back around, sewed, not sewed, they wouldn't even sew, they stapled me back up. 73 staples. Big staples. I'm not talking about little paper staples from your office on your desk. I'm talking about them big, you know, hold cardboard boxes together. You know, they, they, they stapled me for shipping and packing. You could have put a label on me and mail me. They stapled me. So. I kept bleeding, though. You know, they leave a tube in you, a straw, so that whatever fluid is gathering there can, can get out and it just keeps running out. But I, but I didn't, I did not emit plasma. I kept emitting live blood cells. And I did it for like eight or nine hours. And the doctor came back and said, something's wrong, he won't stop bleeding. That kidney won't stop that. Said he's got a pocket of blood here. My whole stomach was full, just blood everywhere. So they, the doctor, I heard the doctor when he cussed. He said, get that D thing out of him. And they went to pulling the staples out. I felt every one of those staples. And I, but I couldn't holler. I just said, ow, ow, ow. Oh. They took them out. They pulled my flesh back open. They hadn't even anesthetized me. And I heard blood running into a pan, just like somebody had turned on a spigot. And I heard the doctor say, we're going to lose him. And I said to him, you better find me. He said, knock him out. Because, see, I'm in there talking. He said, knock him out. You see, it's hard to anesthetize me. I can, I can stay awake a long time. You put me to sleep and I'm still awake. When they cut me the first time for the prostate exam, I heard them cutting me and felt it. And I was up there tapping and singing, Jesus, he brought me all the way. Doctor said, knock him out if you have to use a hammer. I tell him, God's going to get you when I wake up. If he don't, I will. He still laughs about that today. I told him, I'm going to get you. They took the kidney out. So I only have one kidney now. The next day, they come up into the room and they said to my wife and me, I was listening, but I wasn't paying much mind. You know, I, I didn't, you know, I just go away. Please leave me alone. Nurse been waking me up all night, ch checking my blood pressure, seeing if I'm alive, tapping on me. And God said, Would, I told her, if you tap me one more time, <laughs> when I get better, well, you know, I gave them the blues. Doctor came in and said, I want to tell you something. The carcinomas that we took off the kidney were in a leather-like shell. They were in skin that was like leather. We sent them to pathology, and when we cut them open, they spread out like octopus, and they were so wide with so many fingers and tentacles. If they had burst while inside his body, we'd have a different story here today. He would be dead. We don't know how long those carcinomas have been growing on his kidney, but I guarantee you it's at least five years and nobody lives through this. And so they asked my wife to sign so they could keep these carcinomas in their lab and they're still at the University Hospital in Cleveland. They wanted them to show to other you know, students of medicine and whatnot said it was very unusual. But the doctor said, there's something we notice about these carcinomas. They were growing for five years, but they could never get bigger. They had to have something to eat on. So I said to him, well, what were they eating? My kidney? He said, no, they used your kidney for blood, life fluid. They needed blood to live.
because they're alive. He said, but what they ate was themselves. They kept turning and eating itself. It would eat itself and grow and then eat its own growth. So it never got any bigger. When I say every day something was trying to kill me. I know what I'm talking about. And so when I got ready for bone marrow transplant, the doctor said, well, you've had cancer four times and you don't need the transplant. I said, whoa, I've had cancer three times. I had prostate cancer, I had CLL, and I had renal cancer. Where did I have a fourth cancer? He said, you had lung cancer, but we wouldn't tell you about that because that was the least important. The other three were going to kill you faster than the lung cancer. You were still breathing, so we didn't worry about that. So I said, well, what about the, the transplant? He said, well, the good news is you don't need the transplant. And we can never tell you because we don't know how to explain it. But in your body, there is not one cancer cell. Not one. We've tried everything. We've tried everything. We've tested you. We have tested. We have taken blood, blood, blood. And of course, I told him, yeah, you ain't lying. The vampires have been sucking blood out of my arms. Say, yes, we were doing it because I know you had cancer. We wanted to make sure we didn't make a mistake. Bishop Ellis, not only are you in full remission, you are cancer free. You need your blood cells built back up because we killed them all with the chemo. Look at somebody and say, God is a healer. That's it. I'm finished testifying. Sit down. Now, what does all that have to do with your anniversary? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I do know that in your role, you are called to be a healer and a healer because you've been wounded. Wounded healers are the best kind. Listen to what the scripture says. For we have not and high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. In other words, we don't have a Jesus who hasn't been where we are and who has not felt what we feel. Let me Read the text that I have in mind and then hurry up and sit down because I want to go eat. I'm hungry. I didn't had enough church for the day. I'm listening to y'all and already been to the water and all them. That was the raggedest bunch of women I ever seen in my life. I got so tickled, I said, all of them is homeless. Every one of them home. And they got joy. That's what got me. The homeless women with joy. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Lord, leave it to the saints. We can just make a show out of anything. I want to read from 1 Kings chapter 20. Sabrina preached, he is the God of the valleys. 
and I want to preach, he is the God of the mountains. First Kings chapter 20, verses 11, 23, and 28. You stay with me, and I'll let you up. I'll let you up in a few minutes. Thank the Lord for Brother Lint Picker over there. He was standing in the hall. He picked a piece of lint off my suit. And I said, what was that? He said, lint. I said, put it right back. Can't have lint for you. <laughs> Verse 11. And the king of Israel answered and said, tell him. Let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself as he that putteth it off. It'll make sense in a minute. Verse 23. And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are gods of the hill. Therefore, they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain. And surely, we shall be stronger than they. Verse 28. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord. Because the Syrians have said the Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. You may be seated. I was reading the Bible and the story caught my attention when I noticed the language of King Ahab as he com contemplated the impending war with Syria and 30 additional kings who had men at arms. First of all, it was Ahab who gives good advice in this preparatory board meeting before the fight. Listen again to his advice as he talks to the captains and lieutenants of Ben-Hadad. Verse 11, let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself. As he putteth it off. In other words, what does that mean? What does that mean, Brother Ellis? I don't want a one of you men who put on the uniform and gear up for battle to think that you will return back to the barracks bragging about your conquest. You got it? Yes, sir. It's sort of like the old lady in Professor Clump. She said, you may walk over, but you're going to limp back. <laughs> and as far as I can tell, this may be the only wise thing that Ahab has ever said. You know who Ahab was. He's married to that heifer Jezebel. The daughter of the king of Zidodia. A witch. Now 
Now it is believed by Josephus that Ahab really didn't come up with the saying himself but rather he used a proverb that was commonly used during his time. But his warning to King Ben-Hadad proved to be the truth. And even with that truth, his own stupid behavior in going up to Ramoth Gilead where he ultimately died showed us how easy it is for us to even forget our own good advice. He gave advice and then got in another fight and got killed. Now, Shiloh, Please recognize that we all have battles to fight. I know you're wondering if I can preach. Let me hurry up and say to you, I used to be able to. I'm tired already. I'm going to do my lesson and sit down. I ain't here to impress you. I'm here to give you some information and then, you know, chill. We all have battles to fight. Christians have inward battles along with your normal human scuffles. You got stuff going on in the heart and in the mind. Insecurities, fears. You don't want nobody to tell you you're insecure, but you know you. You know you. You looked at you in the mirror this morning. Are you following me? And it's called, usually it's called a battle within a battle. Coming to Christ means, are you listening? It means, right away, it means peace and war at the same time. Coming to Jesus Christ, and I want us to stop fooling people at the altar. Just come on to Jesus. Everything going to be all right. It will be eventually. But coming to Christ means peace and war at the same time. The peace that we have is with God. But the war is with the world system. It means that we're at peace with God, but we're at war with the devil. At peace with God. I don't have to go to the devil. I don't have to go to the world system. We're at war with our own flesh. And because we have wars to fight, we're given harnesses. The word in the Old Testament was harness. The New Testament word from the Greek means armor to wear. We have armor to wear. Now because our enemies are spiritual and not each other, we really need to quit with the fighting with one another because sister, you know, Susie is not the enemy. Your enemy is spiritual. Your enemy is unseen. You, you, you talking to one another, but you're really talking to the wrong person. The enemy is spiritual. Because our enemies are, are spiritual, so must our armor be. 
The armor is divinely prepared and provided or issued. And it's divinely adapted to its purposes. It's not flimsy stuff. But nothing can substitute for it. If you want a bird's eye view of the armor, it's in Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. There's a helmet, there's a breastplate, there's sandals or feet shod, meaning shoes that go with it. There, there is a uniform for the battles that we must fight, which are spiritual. Now, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What is a stronghold? Stronghold is a soldier with ammunition at the top of your fort. That's the one who captures, whoever captures the tower owns the city. Whatever you permit to preside in the tower, he commands your whole town. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Wait, you'll get that in a minute. They had a news, they had some kind of a science uh, overview the other day on, on, on the radio. And Bishop Douglas was driving home and he called me and I turned to it. And they were talking about, they were talking about depression and despair and fear and doubt. They were naming all this stuff and they kept talking about it. And then this other scientist said, but there is proof that wherever gratitude is, fear leaves. Whenever there is gratitude, he said, if you can just think of anything, he wasn't spiritual at all. He said, if you can think in, of anything to be thankful for, even in the middle of fear and doubt and depression and, and, and all that goes with it, if you can find a sense of gratitude, gratitude always trumps fear. It trumps doubt. Now, it took science all this time to discover what God's been trying to tell us since creation. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. See, don't misunderstand strength. As soon as you say strength, we think of Popeye. No, put your arm down. Not talking about your biceps. Joy is a mind thing. And the strength that the scriptures are talking about is strength to overcome the enemy that sits in your towers. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The divine armor must be put on. If you decide to attempt to survive the fight without divine armor, you'll do so to no avail. Now the next lesson from to learn from Ahab's stupidity 
is he never did learn humility in the face of an able God. Ahab misunderstood the prophet's promise regarding God being the God of the plains. He only heard the prophet mention that he was the God of the plains. See, he missed the point. The point was not that God was confined to a valley experience. He's God everywhere. But the prophet was being specific about a circumstance and talking to some people who were in valley situations. This fool said, well, he's the God of the valley. No, 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 you missed the point. You missed the point. He jumps into a battle foolish enough to think that he was invincible. And that God would fight for his puny causes. See, you and I are in trouble when we try to appropriate God for our causes and our causes alone. Nothing used to get on my nerves anymore than these jack leg prophets. You make them mad or you disagree with them. Uh, God's going to get you. God's, uh, I see. I see. Oh, you see nothing. Always, the, and the biggest one is die, die, die. You know, because we're scared of death. Die, die. I see die. He die. Ho, ho, ho. She die. She die dead. She going to die. Show to die. Going to die. And see, one of them did me like that down in Rossville, Tennessee. And I got up and said, sound, Sister Granberry. Everybody going to die, including you. Sound, idiot, sound. I die, 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 die. Just because I didn't let her have her way. Now she goes, mm, die, 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 die. No, you die. You drop dead. You. 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 I know some of y'all say, oh, that's so insensitive. I, I, I don't want to hurt the church, upset the church mother over there. Uh, mother, I don't mean no disrespect. But, you know, Paul told the saints to drop dead. Uh, he did. He, he got so disgusted, he wrote a letter and said, I would to God that he would even remove some of you out of our midst. You know what that means? Drop dead. In English, that's drop dead. Y'all going to be trying to remember that scripture. Next time somebody get on your nerves, say, I would to God that he would even remove. <laughs> Give them Bible for drop dead. Drop dead. Leave me alone. We're always trying to scare somebody. Always trying to spookaboo somebody. Spooking peekaboo. No, no, no. God is too big for that. God doesn't preside over the earth just to take care of our little puny junk. Who are you? Ooh, I'm in trouble now. Mm. When the truth of that whole thing was that God usually fights for his own glory. And for, I agree with that. I support that. He fights for his own name. See, God doesn't just fight for your cause. Now, if your cause is within his plan and cooperates with his will and, and brings glory to his name, well, then, you, you know, you in the fight. But, 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 but otherwise, the overriding and overarching purpose of the battle of God is for his own glory and his own name. Hallelujah. He fights for himself. He fights for his honor. He'll give you everything in the book 
He'll give you a day out of the week. He'll give you all of the days and just ask for one. He'll give you all the money and ask for a dime out of every dollar. He don't ask for much. But when it comes to glory, he don't give you none of that. My glory I'll not give to another. Because all the glory belongs to him. And he'll fight you for it. If you don't believe it, ask Herod. In the fifth chapter of Acts, he sat up on a chair with his crown and his robe on. And he made a speech. And the folk hollered, go ahead. But that was not bad. But when they turned around and said to one another, he must be a God. And Herod didn't correct what they said. God said, I'll show him who God is. God spoke to a gang of worms under the ground and said, go get him. And while he sat there, worms came up out of the ground and ate his hind parts out from under his robe. And when everybody looked again, there wasn't nothing left but a skeleton with a crown on. And the scripture said the reason it happened was because he did not give God the glory. Never forget, beloveds, whatever God does, he does for glory. In Paul's letter to the Colossian church, the apostle tells us whatever God wrought on our behalf, he did it for the praise of his glory. In three places in the first chapter, every time it was for the praise of his glory. One of the faults with personal victory is that we can be deceived into believing that we attained it when in reality we, we may have just commenced the conflict. I made it. No, you're just getting started. When I got out of high school, I wanted to be jumping and going on. And I had to get older and realize that the program was called a commencement exercise. I hadn't finished anything. They were just telling me, you're just beginning. Now, we've not come here to suggest that conflicts have no honor. I mean, I'd certainly be the last one to put forth that life itself does not seem to be mountainous at times. Even though God proved himself in this conflict and, divide, and defied the 31 heathen king's logic. There is that one element of truth in their assertion. The heathen who thought that they would whip the people of God. Because they thought he was confined to the valley. They listened to old silly Ahab. But after Ahab got himself killed and they got their backsides whipped in the fight, it was the wicked that said, their God is the God of the hills. In other words, their God is the God of the mountains. Yes, sir. Ahab told us he was the God in the valley and we tried not to mess with him in the valley. We, that's why we went up in the hills. <laughs> but he didn't tell us that their God lived in the hills too. What Ben-Hadad failed to understand was that it takes just as much grace to survive climbs as it does to weather falls. Scrambling to make it to your peak takes just as much out of you as it does when you fall into the doldrums of your valleys. Nothing comes easy. There's no vacation. Climbing requires energy and effort. 
Reaching the summit requires the use of all your faculties. In the climb, your legs, your arms, your biceps and triceps are put to the ultimate test. One's eyes and thought faculties must be at their keenest. You don't climb for the fun of it in this Christian warfare, but you climb because you recognize that turkeys cluck around on the ground while eagles live in the rocks above. You climb because it's needful if you're going to live above the level of mediocrity. If slopping about with chickens is all you look forward to, then mountain dwelling is not for you. If you like picking up corn off the floor in the middle of chicken feces, help your nasty self. But if you're an eagle, you climb. You don't eat garbage on the floor. You fish your stuff straight out of the water and you eat in the rocks high above the ground. I'm going to bring this discussion to a close. But I want to remind you that he's in the mountain experience during the climb and at the summit. God has always chosen mountain peaks to speak to humanity in profound and certain thunderings. He didn't make a rainbow. Watch this. Give you a couple examples and I'm finished. He didn't make a rainbow until he sat the ark down on Mount Ararat and let Noah and his family out for some fresh air after a year and 10 days of solitary confinement. God made a covenant with the father of the faithful on Mount Hebron. When he called Abraham to offer his son Isaac on an altar. But because Abraham believed God during the climb, God snagged a scapegoat loose the talking angel to tell him to stay your hand God has provided a ram but, but that one scene in the Old Testament became a precursor for a New Testament event because it was at the foot of that same Mount Hebron that somebody planted a little garden one day and named it Gethsemane <laughs> And it was there that another son was being asked to drink from a bitter cup. It was there that another angel was sent. Go and give this son strength. How shall we forget God's mighty acts in Arabia? The Jews had just come out of Africa and were en route to a land that they'd only heard of. But they had to pass through the land of the Arabs, their first cousins. And there a mountain, there was a mountain that God decided to use as his pulpit. It was in this mountain that God called Moses to receive the commandments and the law. It was in this mountain that God revealed his hinder parts to Moses. It was in this mountain that God thundered and sent fire enough for the people on the ground to start thinking that their pastor had been burned up. Mount Sinai, the mount of God. The place where the Jew and the Arab acknowledge the God of Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Jacob, and Esau. 
He went there. It was just a place. Yes, and Esau. I, I thought that I'd better mention before I do that. I thought I'd better mention Mount Pisgah. And while I'm there, it's the mountain that I call Lookout Mountain in the Old Testament. It's where Moses looked out and saw the promised land. It was just adjacent to and subordinated to Sinai. But after looking, Moses had to go to another mountain called Nebo. And it was there where he preached his own funeral and then went behind the rocks and laid down and died without an earthly audience. It was on Nebo that God sent the upper takers, angels, y'all, to carry Moses' body away so that nobody has been able to find it. But one day on another mountain, some several thousand years later, Moses showed up at a board meeting with God in the flesh and another fella that had gotten away by mysterious circumstances in a fiery taxi cab named Elijah. It was there on a mountain called Transfiguration that I hear Peter getting happy and shouting, Lord, it was good for us to have been here. I'm coming to a close in a moment, but I have to mention the one mountain that became the place for our salvation. It never meant anything until uh, your Lord and my God went there. It was uh, before he went there, it was just another ignominious place of death and human destruction. Before he went there, it was just a place next door to a place called Gehenna or, or hell where bodies burned and the stench of human flesh was so torrid until one would have to cover their faces to pass by it. This mountain was just another place where disemboweled people were left to hang on a Roman tree fashioned into a torture chamber. You know the place. But I want to tell it to you again. Last we forget, it's called Mount Calvary. Mm. It was the place where God allowed himself in the flesh to die. It was the place where God, who had fashioned himself a body like mine, dared to defy his own immutability by emptying himself into human flesh and then suffer crucifixion just to save me from the wrath to come. It was at Mount Calvary where Jesus changed the calendar from B.C. to A.D. It was at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart, I'm getting happy, rolled, rolled away. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was at Mount Calvary where blood became an inoculation against sin and death. Calvary was the only mountain that I've not been asked to climb because he climbed it for me. Somebody say glory. But, but one of these glad mornings, I'm... I'm finishing up now. I'm finishing. Yeah, yeah. You can help me if you want to. I'm one of these glad morning. We're going to meet on another mountain with its summer peak, its summit peak in the second heaven. All of the blood washed trophies of grace will be called to come to a place called Mount Zion, where the Lamb is the light. They'll be shouting on the hills of glory when we reach the land of which we've heard the story. They'll be shouting on the hills of God. We're going to get out of here one day. It'll be soon, saints. It won't be long. Yeah! The sooner he comes, the happier I'll be. Yeah! Zion, the mountain of the Lord's house, 
Zion, the home of the soul. Zion, the land of rest for the weary traveler. Zion, the place for which the Jews sang and longed for. Zion, the city of the great king. I hear David crying now. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad. That's it. He's God in the valley. He's God when you're in the downtime. He's God when you can't see above your shoe tops. But he's also God of every mountain. Yes. He's God in every downward slope. And he's God in every tedious climb. If you want to know where I'd rather be, I'll tell you exactly where I'd rather be. I'd rather be anywhere so long as Jesus is there. If he's not there, it's hell anyhow. Hallelujah. Yeah! I'm finished, y'all. But he's the God in the mountain. He's the God when it's hard. He's God when it's smooth. He's God when it's uptime. He's always God. Pick your face up. Stop falling apart. Stop all that crying and belly aching. Quit all that griping and moaning. You have a God that's able. Able! Somebody say able! I ain't supposed to do all that. I'm tired. He's the God of the mountain. He's the God of the mountain. Dr. Allen, I'm going on back up north. Regardless to what comes within the next 12 months, you're about to be tried. I can't explain how I know it. But there's a storm coming. There's a storm coming. And you ain't got to run from it. The reason you don't have to run is you've already learned the behavior of an eagle. Eagles don't run from storms. I'm working my way to my seat. Eagles don't hide when the thunder roll. Chickens stick their head up under the mother's wing. But when the eagle hears that a storm is coming, an eagle gets near water, finds his food, gets something to eat, and sit there and wait a minute. Plucks out the dead feathers. You might have to pluck off some dead weight. You may have to get rid of some jackasses holding on to you. He takes his feathers. He cleans his nostrils. He picks his nose. Because where he's going, the air is thin. And just when the rain starts falling, he doesn't cry about the weather, but he runs into the storm. He goes into it and uses the wind in the storm to lift him above the cloud. Yeah! And while it's raining, he's up in the sunshine. Yeah! Hey, Alan! <laughs> 